Well, good morning, Word of Grace. How you doing? Uh, no, I am not Ryan, okay? Uh, for those of you who are wondering, I know people get us confused all the time, but hey, I'm the one that's now wearing glasses for the first time in my life. And, and, and no, I've not heard from him, uh, except for two words yesterday in a text, which was, um, all set? <laughs> so I thought I'd mess with him. Oh, was I preaching tomorrow? No. I'm just... <laughs> He sent me one picture of he and Laura there in St. Mark's Square in Venice just to make me really jealous. And I just pictured him breaking out in a cold sweat in the middle of St. Mark's Square just to have some fun. No, I didn't do that to him, but I sure, I sure was tempted to do it, all right? It, it's, and you know what? It's an absolute blast to um, uh, follow um, on this platform today Isaiah and Ian and what God's doing in their lives as, as um, sons in the faith and as students at our college and his friends in ministry, and uh, love you guys, proud of you, just wanted to say that, all right? And it's a joy to kick off this series with you, this Life on Mission. Um, for those of you who know me well, you know that when we're talking about our lives as followers of Jesus and the mission of Jesus, I could probably preach this whole sermon all by my, or this whole series all by myself, all right? Probably today, this morning, I could get rolling on this, couldn't I, Isaiah? But but uh, God help us to be concise today. I, I'll, I'll warn you in advance. I could be a little bit random today because my mind has been flooded with thoughts on how to kick off such an important topic in the day in which we live. Life on mission. I want to take us back to a passage that you know, Ryan has let me know that you've hung out in a little bit over the last several weeks if you've talked about the I am's of Christ and all that. We're going to go back to John chapter 15 to kick this off this morning. I know it's very familiar to you. John 15 is part of Jesus' final instructions to his disciples the night before he goes to the cross. These final instructions about the mission he's about to send them on for the rest of their lives. He is getting them ready to take over his mission. And how many of you know, if you knew it was your last night on earth, you would want to say the things that are most important? And that's what's happening here in John chapter 15. We're going we're gonna to read the first eight verses. Uh, do we have those on the screen today, or I can just read them right out? Huh? Okay, here we go. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus said this, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, the husbandman, the caretaker. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it bear, may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And Jesus says in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing of eternal consequences. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch, dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, what a great promise, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove, how do we prove? Bearing much fruit. So prove to be my disciples. Father, thank you for your word today. It's powerful. Your word says of itself that it's great seed. And I thank you for the good soil in the hearts of your people that are gathered in this place today. Lord Jesus, for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of your mission, I pray that the good seed of your word would find good soil and root deeply in our hearts and bring forth a harvest 100-fold for your kingdom and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Can we say amen together? Amen. amen. For Jesus to be on mission meant just one thing. Let's go change the world. 
when he was starting his ministry in John chapter 4, and he takes his disciples through an area of the world called Samaria, where no Jew would go. The Samaritans were half-breeds. They were despised by the Jews. And Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. He takes his disciples through Samaria to begin to break them out of their cultural biases, because their call was going to be to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And while he is having this conversation with the woman at the well and the disciples show up after they go into town for some burgers and fries and they're surprised seeing him having this conversation, Jesus said to the guys, when they said, who fed you? Jesus said, you don't understand. My meat, my food, my mission is to to fulfill the work, to finish the work of him who sent me. It was all about the work. My meat, Jesus said, that which sustains and satisfies me, that which keeps me going every day, that which fuels me, is to do the will of my Father in heaven and to finish his work. Is that our meat today? To do the will of him who sent us and to finish his work? So so for Jesus to be on mission meant one thing, let's go change the world. For the disciples to to be on mission meant one thing that we have been called to change the world around us from our city to the nations. One thing, let's go change the world. The mission for the disciples was all about learning. Jesus said, take my yoke and learn from me. The mission for the disciples was all about following. Take up, my, take up your cross and follow me. The mission of Jesus was all about training and preparation for changing the world. The mission for the disciples of Jesus was all about doing his work, life on mission. In Mark chapter three, we're told that Jesus prays all night and the next morning he gets up and he goes and handpicks his disciples. And it says in Mark chapter three that Jesus chose them, catch this, to be with him and to preach his gospel and to do his work. First of all, Jesus simply has chosen you and I to be with him and to grow in relationship and to grow in intimacy with him. That's the first thing on mission. But the second thing is Jesus has chose us that we might do the work with him, the work that he started. In Mark chapter 3, he chose them to be with him. In John chapter 15, if we would have read on, we would have read in verse 16 that Jesus said this, you didn't choose me, I chose you. You think you chose me, but in reality, I have chosen you and I've chosen that you might bear fruit and do my work. In Mark 16, at the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus has ascended to the Father, but as the disciples are doing the work, as the disciples are on mission, as they are preaching and teaching and healing and casting out demons and doing all the stuff, I love what it says, and the Lord was working with them. He was still with them, and they were doing the work together, the work of the gospel, the work of God, the mission. They were in it together, taking this gospel and the love of Jesus to the whole world. So we are not not on a mission for God like the Blues Brothers, if anybody can remember those days. Come on. We are on a mission with Jesus. We're not doing a job for God. He's invited us to participate in him, not just in his life and not just in his family. He's invited us to participate with him in his work on earth until this gospel of the kingdom is preached to every nation, tribe, and tongue, and then he promised the end will come. Isn't that right? So we're on a mission with Jesus to love the whole world. Hear me today, 2,000 years later, the mission has not changed. As followers of Jesus, we are so tempted to make our mission in life about so many things that aren't the mission of Jesus. And we say our missions are family, our missions are job, our missions are career, our missions are business. We can talk about all kinds of things, but God has never changed our mission and our assignment. We may try to change it, but we still have the same assignment that the first disciples had. So if our mission And God's mission are two different things, follower of Jesus. Guess who needs to adjust? If we don't adjust, then we're not experiencing life on mission with God. 
In Mark chapter 3, he chose them to be with him. In Mark chapter 16, he was working with them together in mission. And before he ascended to the right hand of the Father, in Acts chapter 1, the disciples are having another one of those goofy conversations. How many times do I have to tell you the same thing, guys? Not that he ever has to do that with us. Isn't that right? Come on now. Huh? Jesus, is this the time that you're going to kick the Romans out of Israel and set up your kingdom on earth? And what did he say? Guys, it's not for you to know the times and seasons that have been set by my father's authority. Okay? But you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. What was Jesus saying in that moment? He was saying very simply, guys, on earth you're not going to know everything. You got to be good with that. On earth, you're not going to know everything, but you are going to become something. And what you become together has the power to change the whole world. You're not going to know everything, but you are to become something, family of God. And what you become together can change the entire world. So, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, it's being a learner, it's being a follower. All right, it's being an ambassador representing his kingdom on earth. It's being a reproducer, a disciple to someone that's discipling somebody else. You only got to be one step ahead of the person you're discipling to help them grow in their faith. All right, a disciple represents the kingdom of heaven on earth. But to be discipled simply means that replicated in your life is what was in Jesus' life. What needs to be replicated in our lives as disciples? Three things, all right? The character of Jesus needs to be replicated in our lives. If we are being a disciple and growing as a disciple, we're looking more like Jesus every day. The ways of Jesus need to be replicated in our life. The way he thinks, the way he acts, the way he does things. It's not just doing God's work. It's doing God's work in God's way with God's attitude. Come on. Replicating the character of Jesus in our lives, replicating the ways of Jesus in our lives. And here's the third one. Disciples have replicated in their lives the mission of Jesus. To be a disciple means to be on mission with Jesus. A lot of people who call themselves Christians have never even started becoming disciples. Because they have not allowed the Spirit of God And the leaders in their life to begin to replicate the character, ways, and mission in them. What is our college all about? Beyond getting degrees, it's all about replicating the character, ways, and mission in the next generation. Because that's what changes the world. Let's keep going here. The character, ways, and mission of Jesus are stamped on the spirit of the disciple. And if the name Christ means anointed one in the Greek then it could stand to reason that the name Christian, which we call ourselves, can simply mean those who continue in his anointing. How good is that? That's who we are. To be a Christian is to continue in that anointing to heal, to preach, to reach, to touch, to change, to deliver, all in Jesus' name. That anointing that was on Jesus is to continue on our lives as we are engaged in the mission that he started when he came to planet Earth. That is our assignment as followers of Jesus, to continue That's our privilege to continue in that anointing that is on our life because we are in Christ and Christ by his spirit is in us. One who continues in his anointing to accomplish his mission on earth. So what we become together, friends, has the power to change the world. The way we become is by following and training And doing his work together. You know what? And as I was re-editing these notes earlier this morning, I said, no, that's not it. The way we become is by following training and not just doing his work. Hear me. It was a huge change in my mind to say it's not about just doing his work. It's about having a passion to finish his work together. Let me explain the differences that hit me early this morning. Let me ask you a question. How motivated are people to do anything? 
How motivated are people to do anything if they don't have a goal? Not at all. Isn't that right? I mean, I, growing up, I hated jogging. I hated running. I could play basketball all night long because there was a goal. Put the ball in the net. Isn't that right? Just to run around a track or run through a field or run cross country. Why do that? Human beings are not motivated to do anything unless there's a goal. So why has the church not finished the mission of Jesus yet? Maybe because we've talked about when we get around to it doing his work, instead of saying God has given us a goal to finish his work, and when we're focused on that goal, we'll get on with the mission that we've been called to accomplish. So I want to say today, one more time, the way we become... That group of people that have the power to change the world, the way we become is by, I lost my spot here, here we go. The way we become is by following and training and having a passion to finish his work together. I think that was the first church. Grant, you just read about it from the book of Acts. Why did they turn their whole world upside down? First of all, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit with boldness to go do it. But secondly, they sincerely believe that Jesus was coming back at any time and we got to get the work done. We got to get the word out there. They had a goal to reach the whole world. And because they had a goal, the word of the Lord went everywhere. All of Jerusalem was saturated with their doctrine. Paul, Barnabas, others began to take the word everywhere. All of Asia heard the word of the Lord, Acts 19 tells us. Because they had a goal and they had a passion. I really believe that most Christians really do want to please and serve God. I believe with all my heart. But many of us frustratingly and repeatedly come up short. And we feel defeated. And we feel disengaged. And we feel like there's got to be more to life. And I'm not, and I'm not making it. And I'm, and I'm missing it. Why? You know, I, I, think, I think it's a training thing. I think it's a preparation thing. I think it's a discipling thing. It's a training thing. Let let me illustrate it this way. Okay, picture this. Last night, I'm sitting in my recliner with the family, all right? I'm sitting in my recliner, thoroughly thoroughly enjoying J.T. Barrett dismantling the Penn State defense in the fourth quarter, all right? How many of you just love that, huh? And in the middle of the fourth quarter, imagine that I get a knock on my door, during commercial, hallelujah, all right? And, and, and I go answer my door, and there's a group of guys, fit, tr- trim, sharp, coats, ties, and, and they say, are you Randy Young? Yeah, I'm Randy Young, who are you? We are the U.S. Olympic Committee. Okay, what are you doing at my door? Well, we've been looking for someone to run the marathon for the United States Olympics in 2018. Okay, what are you doing at my door, all right? Well, we've been checking records, all right? And in the midst, they come into my house and their game's on and there's just food, food everywhere. My favorite, come on, you got game time food, don't you? I won't go into detail. But they said, we've been checking records. We went all the way back into your presidential physical fitness record when you were in elementary school. We, We dug into body types. We looked at bone structure. We looked at percentage of body fat. Like Michael Phelps, who is an Olympic legend in the swimming pool, isn't that right? Because he had the perfect body to be an Olympic swimmer. We have determined out of over 300 million Americans that you're our guy. Actually, I am totally shocked by this group at my door. (laughs) For me, the 100 meter dash had literally become, how fast can I get to from the couch to the fridge before the commercial's over? And then I start to dream about what they're talking about. Man, living in the the Olympic Village for a month, all that unbelievable gourmet food everywhere. (laughs) World-class athletes all around me. 
the eyes of the world watching me run the marathon, maybe standing on the podium one day, stars and stripes behind me, the star spangled banner, you know, here I am, baby. Yeah, I begin to dream about all this and then it hits me, no matter how hard I try, <laughs> there ain't no way. To go on this mission for my country, I need to train and not just try. And how many Christians sincerely wanting to love God, serve God, follow God, and be involved in God's mission, grit their teeth and just say, I'm going to try harder this time. And God is saying, quit trying harder and start training better for the mission that I've got for you. For my country, I need to train. I need to rearrange my life, my days on mission around the practices and people that will empower me to do the things I cannot do now by training harder, by trying harder. I need the disciplines and routines of an athlete if I'm going to become an athlete. And as followers in Jesus, of Jesus, we need the disciplines and routines of Jesus and to train in those disciplines and routines if we are going to be fit for the mission that he's called us to, to change the world. And I'm talking about spiritual disciplines now. We don't have time to get into all of this, but daily prayer, daily times of worship, meditating in the word of God, learning to fast and pray and pull down strongholds in Jesus' name, daily service of our brothers and sisters and in our community to the lost, the capacity to sacrifice. I could go on and on with these spiritual disciplines. But understand that spiritual disciplines, the, the word discipline gets a bad rap here because we think, oh, discipline, stay away from me. But every spiritual discipline is simply an on-ramp into our lives to bring the incredible grace of God and power into our lives to be what we're called to be and do what we're called to do. That's the purpose of these spiritual disciplines. And we got to quit trying harder. we got to start training better if we're going to fulfill the mission that Jesus has for us individually and as a church. Every day. Spiritual disciplines. This is how Jesus trained his first disciples for three years to get them ready to change the world. Anybody, uh, anybody remember the old movie Karate Kid? Come on. Remember Mr. Miyagi? And was it daniel son? Is that who it was? And he's sick and tired of waxing the car. Wax on. Wax. Isn't that right? And he's sick and tired of painting the fence. Why do I have to do this? It's so mundane. It's so routine. It's not, it's not, it doesn't bring instant gratification. It's not bearing immediate fruit. Why am I doing this? Like the, like the spiritual discipline, sometimes they get boring. And it's just like, why do I do this every day? And then one day, Mr. Miyagi says, Daniel, defend yourself. And suddenly, all those motions makes sense. That's how the spiritual disciplines are for you and I. And Jesus wants us to train better, not just try harder, to be on his team, to change the world. So, John chapter 15, last instructions for the mission that Jesus was sending on. Jesus called his disciples to abiding. Abide in me daily, Practice the disciplines daily. Stay put in me. Daily, stay focused. Stay, daily, stay engaged. Daily, stay on mission. John 15 is the last night before Jesus goes to the cross. It's his final instructions for the mission. Um, actually, the punch of the passage in my mind begins in the last verse of chapter 14 and verse 31 where he says, let's get up, let's leave this place, let's go from here. In the upper room that night, the night before he goes to the cross, he shared the Passover meal with those that he loved to the end. Not only did he share the Passover meal, but John chapter 13, when nobody was willing to take the towel because they were too insecure, Jesus took the towel and he served everyone by washing their feet. Not only did he wash Andrew's feet, and Bartholomew's feet, he washed Peter's feet, knowing that in a few hours he was going to deny him three times. Not only did he wash Peter's feet, he washed Judas' feet, knowing that in a few hours he was going to sell him for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus said, if I, teacher and Lord, that's who you call me, have done this for you, shouldn't you ought to do this for one another? 
Shouldn't you be serving one another as well? I have set before you an example. He goes from chapter 13 after washing feet and sharing the Passover meal. He gets into chapter 14, begins to share the most important things he could say. Don't worry, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, when I go, the Holy Spirit, he's going to come to you. He's going to become another one just like me to you. Another comforter, just like me. Another of the same kind, literally the Greek word means. And yeah, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. And he's pouring his guts into these guys the last night before he goes to the cross. And he quiets their hearts. It's the culmination of three years of training. And then he says, let's go from here. He's changing topics. He wants a change of scenery, a change of location. So down the steps from the upper room and through the narrow streets of Jerusalem in the dark and past the gates of the temple, the massive gates that had each gate had a huge golden uh, vine on it. The vine was the national symbol of Israel. They go past the temple gates and down through the streets and out, out through the gates of the city and down through the, the Kidron Ravine and up the other side to one of Jesus' favorite spots. He's got him in a vineyard. And against that backdrop of gnarled, silhouetted, wetted vines in the moonlight, Jesus starts with these words, I am the vine, the true. I am the true vine. You know what? Now he's really got their attention. But he doesn't stop there. And he says, and my father is the husband, but my father is the caretaker of this vine. Now he's really got their attention. I can imagine not only dead silence, but shock. Since they were little boys, they were taught that the vine that God loved was Israel and the caretakers were the Pharisees. What Jesus said in the first two verses of, the, of John 15 was absolute revolution. Everything you've ever known, everything you've experienced, everything it's all done as of tomorrow with my cross. Because the Pharisees are out and Israel is out. They are not, the, my, the true vine is going to be everybody that connects with me by faith and confession of sin. And my father is going to be the one who takes care of this whole thing. Absolute statement of revolution. This is no longer going to be a little sect of Judaism. This is a whole new vine, a whole new way of life, and a whole new mission from God. And those who have not borne fruit, he says, they're going to be taken away. And those who bear fruit, you know what? They get the prize of being pruned. Ouch. Anybody hate being pruned? Huh? I'm not talking about the juice. I've always hated pruning because I thought, man, what did I do wrong, God? Am I being judged for something? Why am I suffering this cutback? Because that's what pruning is, is that right? But let's realize that pruning is not necessarily, it's not a sign of judgment. It is actually a sign of health. If you've got a plant that's producing well and you want it to produce better, you cut back the branches. Because the life is in the sap. And the more the sap has to travel along the branches, the less sap there is to produce the fruit on the branches. So to conserve sap, and I think, you know, you look at John 15, you say, where's the Holy Spirit and all this? I think, I think the Holy Spirit is the sap that carries the life that produces the fruit. So we call it fruit of the Spirit, isn't that right? He's everywhere in this passage. So pruning is a sign. They have a saying in England for the best rose bushes, ask the neighbor that hates you the most to cut back your rose bush. <laughs> Why? Because the life is in the sap. You don't want the life to be taken up through long branches. You want sweet fruit to be produced. It's not a sign of judgment. It's a sign of health. Shorter branches mean sweeter fruit. Jesus alluded shorter branches mean, mean more fruit. And therefore, he says, abide in me, stay put in me, connect with me, stay engaged with me. Let's do the work together. Let's stay on mission. Let me prune you. Don't get worried about the cutbacks I'm causing in your life because they will result ultimately in greater fruit and glory for me. So Hudson Taylor said this revelation of John 15 became the secret of his spiritual strength and the secret of his kingdom productivity with the China Inland Mission. So Jesus said, abide in me because it's the only way to bear fruit. Abide in me, it's key to life on mission. Abide in me, verse five, and you will bear much fruit. And then he says in verse seven and eight, and ask me. Don't just abide in me, but ask me. 
Because as we ask God for things, we bear much fruit, and God is glorified. So this life on mission is to be, John 15, an overflow of our intimacy and our asking in God. What kinds of things do you ask God for? When we are daily and passionately on mission, we find ourselves asking God for different things than we would typically ask for. I'm challenged to the core with the invitation of Psalm chapter 2, verse 8, where God says through the psalmist, ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. That is the fulfillment of this mission that we're called on together. Ask of me and I will give nations, tribes, and tongues to you as your inheritance. This is Becky and I's passion for our tribal work in Colombia, our passion for our tribal work in Vietnam. We believe in our lifetime that every tribe in Colombia, every tribe in Vietnam, God, let it be true. Let us be involved in your work so that every tribe in those nations has a church in its culture, on its soil, and in its language to the glory of God. It's not happening right now. Here's another Big ask, life mission scripture. Psalm 67, one and two, maybe you have quoted this before. God be gracious to us, bless us, and make your face shine upon us. That's a big ask, isn't it? But don't stop there. God be gracious to us, bless us. Ian talked about Abraham, that God brought his blessings down on Abraham, that Abraham might be a blessing to the peoples around him, that they in turn might taste and see that the Lord is good and give blessing, praise, and honor and glory to God. Be gracious to us, bless us, make your face shine upon us, verse 2, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all peoples. Verse 4, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Verse 7, God does bless us that the ends of the earth may fear him. God is saying, watch, it's fine to ask God for the things you need, but take it to a whole nother level because you're on mission with me. Ask of me and I will give the nations as an inheritance. Please notice the John 15 progression with me. Jesus said, you're bearing fruit, it's good. It's a sign that you're a healthy branch. But as a healthy branch, more fruit, to go from fruit to more fruit, I'm going to prune you from time to time. And to go from more fruit to much fruit, you got to abide and you got to ask. Jesus wants us as his followers on mission to go from fruit to more fruit to much fruit that his father might be glorified. And our life on mission will glorify God as we move through this progression and That is our one big purpose. So if John 15 uh, expects us to bear fruit together, let me ask a question, how how do we do it? How do we bear kingdom fruit on mission together for Jesus? I want to look at one more passage of scripture here in these last five minutes, and hopefully we can wrap this up. When we're on mission with Jesus, hear me, everybody gets an assignment. Nobody's on the bench. Nobody's on the practice squad. Nobody's on injured reserve. When we're on mission with Jesus, everybody gets an assignment. In Romans chapter 12, and we won't take time to turn there to read it for the sake of time, but I'll I'll go through it with you as best I can. Paul is talking about in this mission, we are called to function as a body. And in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Uh, In the light of everything we've talked about in chapters 1 through 11, how how great a salvation coming through Abraham and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, verse 8, and the mission that we have in verse 9 and 10. He says, therefore, in chapter 12, in light of all this stuff, our salvation and our calling, he said, I beg you, brothers, in the light of all this stuff, present your bodies a living sacrifice to God, wholly acceptable, which is your reasonable service of worship in light of all that God has done for you. Present your bodies. Because your bodies, brothers and sisters, your bodies belong to God. 
Present your bodies because they are a sign, your hands, your feet, your mouth. They are assigned to a mission from God. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Somebody told me one time the only problem with living sacrifice is they keep crawling off the altar. Every time the heat's turned up, they just crawl off the altar. Can anybody identify with that besides me, all right? As a living sacrifice, holy, how do you do that? Abide, stay put, okay? And he goes on in verse two, it says, do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to the way this world thinks because this life is more than a house in the burbs. This life is more than climbing the corporate ladder. This life is more than a healthy 401k. This life is bigger than that for the follower of Jesus. We are on mission with God together. Don't be conformed, but be transformed. Morph. Anybody have kids that love Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? It's Morphin time, guys. Anybody like Transformers movies? It's time to transform. This life on mission is still about Jesus and changing the world. So present your bodies. They belong to God and get them engaged. Your body every day engaged in the work of God on mission. And how do we do that? As a kid growing up in church, I I think every Sunday weekly I would say, I consecrated myself to God. I'm in the altars. I'm saying, God, I belong to you. I belong to you. And then I'd have my moments through the week. You know what I'm talking about? And I'd be back in the altar next week. God, I belong to you. I'm yours. Everything I have is yours. Do what you want to with my life. And it never got beyond that, that consecration theology. And what does God want us to do once we say, I belong to you? Well, Paul answers this question for us. And he says in verse, chapter 12, verse 3, as each of you has received a gift. Do you know that the moment you said yes to Jesus, not only did he give you the gift of salvation, but he made you a gift to the body of Christ. As each has received a gift, do you know that your gift is for my benefit and my gift is for your benefit as we function as a body together? As each has received a gift, Peter says in 1 Peter 4, as each has received a gift, use it to, as a display of the manifold, many-sided grace of God on the body of Christ. As we function in our giftings as a body, we fulfill the mission of Jesus together. Three gift lists in the New Testament, Ephesians 4, the gifts of the Son, he gave gifts to the church, evangelists, prophets, pastors, teachers, apostles, to train the people of God to do the work of the ministry, not to do the work of the ministry themselves. He gave gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, nine gifts, directly correlating to the omnipresence of Jesus, the omnipotence of Jesus, okay, and, and the omniscience of Jesus, his all-knowing, his all-power, his all-awareness. Can't break that down for you right now. We've got to keep moving. But this gift list, Romans chapter 12, Gifts to Father are these motivations, how you have primarily been wired. Some of us are prophetic in nature. Some of us have teacher anointings. Some of us are exhorters. Some of us are, 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 are wired as servants, givers, leaders, mercy, all these, all these giftings. And Paul makes this one simple command in Romans 12. He says, as you have been gifted by the Father and made a gift to the body, he says two words, exercise it. Exercise the gift that God has made of you. This is one of the ways that we go on mission together to change the world. Exercise the gift by abiding and bearing fruit and being a disciple and finishing his work. So if I asked you today, how has God the Father gifted you? And how are you using that gift to the body called word of grace daily and sacrificially? What would you say? What would you say? If if that's what it means to be on mission together, if that's how we're going to change the world, by functioning as a body, where's your spot? No. No adenoids, no tonsils, no appendixes in the body of Christ. You know, just 
body's better off if I'm not, they can just, they can do without me. No, we're all necessary, we're all important. Your gift is for my benefit, my gift is for your, your benefit. And as we serve God and serve one another, we show the world what Jesus looks like. Let's wrap this up. I, um, when I was in Bible college, in a galaxy far, far away and a long time ago, um, I had an Acts professor named Ruth Bruce. She was really old. She was in her 60s. <laughs> hey. <laughs> she grew up on the mission field in India and served God her whole life in India. And she retired by becoming a Bible college professor. And to hear the book of Acts through an Eastern mindset was absolutely fascinating. She told the story one time of all the missionaries in, in India gathered up in the north, in the Hindu north, praying for the nation. And in this gathering of missionaries in prayer, through the night as they prayed, suddenly one man, a groaning, chilling intercession, one man through the night calling on God, unintelligible, deep groanings, deep passion. The next morning they asked this man, you know, what was that all about? And he said, as we were praying together, he said, I had a vision from God. He said, in this vision, there was, there was this grand, glorious head, so attractive, and immediately in my spirit, I knew it was Jesus. And I was filled with joy, and I was so attracted to the beauty of our head, Jesus Christ. But he said, in this vision, as it panned back from the head, suddenly I began to see the body. I saw the trunk. I saw the arms and the legs going down to the hands and the fingers. And the farther the body got away from the head in my vision, the smaller they got, the more childlike, the more infantile. So when they got to the hands and the feet, they looked like newborns, little hands and feet. And it was grotesque and it gripped my heart and it caused me to weep and groan when Jesus said to me by the spirit, this is how I see my body in India today. Brothers and sisters, your God has a preferred vision for Word of Grace Church. We serve a grand, glorious head, Jesus Christ himself. And his vision for Word of Grace Church is a mature, functioning body of believers, loving one another, serving one another, displaying Jesus to the community, and changing the world until he comes again. This is what it means to be on mission individually and together for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He held nothing back from us. We can't hold anything back from him. Let's quit trying harder, let's train better, and let's serve our king together on mission until he returns. God has all of us on a mission and folks, it's time for his glory and kingdom to train better, to abide deeper, to ask more, and to grow up in Christ. To grow up in Christ. None of us are called to be hearers of the word. We're called to be doers of the word. I just want to give the Holy Spirit a chance to underscore something in your heart today. Maybe it's something I said, maybe it's something I didn't say, but the Holy Spirit's just lasering into your spirit right now. Say, God, is there something you want me to take away from this message today? To start today? Because I don't want to just be a hearer, I want to be a doer of your word. Lord Jesus, for the sake of this precious body of believers and its life and joy and health in you, for the sake of this delightful community called Chesterland Beyond, Jesus, that you died for that needs to see an ongoing loving display of what you're really like through your church. For the sake of the greater Cleveland area, yes, God, even for the sake of far off nations, but most importantly, for the sake of your great name and the glory that you deserve, give us a fresh passion to train and to grow and to abide and to serve one another and to love you contagiously 
and to become that body that will change the world on mission until you come again. I've asked the worship team to help us with a little chorus that is a declaration, a simple declaration of faith that maybe you sang a long, long time ago. But can we stand to our feet as we sing this little song? I, it's a discipleship song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Make it your declaration afresh today. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. 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 Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turn. We have decided, we have decided as the family of God to follow Jesus. We have decided as Word of Grace in Chesterland, Ohio. We have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Now, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our glorious head, I commit this precious body of believers to you. I pray, God, that this coming year and decade will be marked by life on mission together as it's never been done before at this church. I pray from Chesterland to the nations, people will recognize that Jesus is God, and that Jesus is real, and that Jesus is love as they walk in mission together. Give them guidance. I pray for the leadership team that you will show them the way forward. You will mark out territories for them, places for them, assignments for them, God, where as a body they can extend your love, grace, and mercy. And may they know the joy that can only come by serving you hard together in the trenches, in mission, until you come again. I commit this precious church and the mission you have for it into your precious hands and for the glory of God our Father. And all the church said together, amen, amen.